Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Last week, we talked about teaching, quote, social studies, unquote. We saw how social studies as a framework is something of an empty vessel that can be used to convey any number of ideologies or values. Uh, One thing we noted in passing was the historical hermeneutic or principle of interpretation that was hinted at in one definition that was kind of Marxist, looking at history as fundamentally a power struggle between classes. Today, we have an alternative historical hermeneutic to propose, that of history as fundamentally a story, which necessarily implies a storyteller. Feel free to correct or nuance that, but I think (laughs) that's the main thrust of what we're going to say today. But first, I have a question for you. If you could have a Muppet adaptation of any classic book or movie, what would it be? I'm not going to ask you why, because you don't have to justify this decision. But I would like to hear some some casting recommendations if you have them. Okay. For me, it has to be Citizen Kane. Ooh. <laughs> that is and a solid decision. <laughs> I believe, I think Kermit should be Citizen Kane. No, I'm sorry, not Citizen Kane. Um, the person f- trying to figure out what rosebud means the the investigator is he ever named i forget i don't know we never see his face do we? i don't i don't think we do i think we he's just always he's always in the foreground yeah. and facing away from the camera but um <laughs> that'll be great with kermit <laughs> it'd be funny because it would just be his voice all the time yeah <laughs> um and i don't know um i think i think the one human actor it should just be someone random in the background that would that'd be the funniest thing to me i think it's just like who's the human actor he's it's just it's that guy <laughs> there he is he's gone there he goes. cameo <laughs> appearance by a genuine human being <laughs> but yeah citizen kane with uh with with kermit as the investigator i think citizen kane should be Fozzie Bear, that's just funny. And I like it. Rosebud will be played <laughs> by. <laughs> now don't give away what Rosebud is. I'm not. <laughs> but uh, Animal, because that's even funnier. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm. Greg? Uh, well, might as well go with Princess Bride. <laughs> Good choice as well. <laughs> is, there, is, there, is there any question that Princess Bride isn't a good answer to besides what's a terrible movie that no one should watch? <laughs> oh, um, and Kermit the Frog can play the man in black. And Miss Piggy, of course, gets to play the princess, whatever, Buttercup. Buttercup. <laughs> because Buttercup is a fitting name for Miss Piggy. That's true. Um, <laughs> Uh, Inigo Montoya gets played by Animal. Thank you for that help. <laughs> uh, Vincini gets played by Fozzie Bear. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And um, I'm just imagining that classic dialogue exchange, but in Fozzie Bear's voice, and it's perfect. <laughs> and Andre the Giant, um, what's his character's name? Uh, Fezzik. Fezzik, no. yeah. Fezzik. No, Fezzik. I thought, oh, wait, no, who's the... Vicini oh, did I turn around? The... Yeah, Vicini on the Fezzik. Okay. Yeah. Fezzik is played, of course, by the giant Muppet character whose name is Sweetums. Sweetums, yeah. That's yes. right. Yes. <laughs> Very Amazing. good casting. So, there you go. Yeah, it's that song. Who's Prince so. Humperdinck, though? Oh, good question. <sighs> who who um I Kim. feel like the professor would be a very humorous choice for that. <laughs> I don't and and the then what? Beaker's the man with six fingers? Sure. Oh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Honeydew. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Honeydew, Honeydew. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Right. His head looks like a honeydew. Right. <laughs> Emily, your turn. <laughs> All right. I, I think I'm going to go with Pride and Prejudice. I'm so glad I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really glad I didn't say Princess Bride because it was on my list. <laughs> um, uh, that was the other one I thought of too. It's just like, the, what other classic movies would be funniest? And that's them. Yeah. Um, I think Kermit and Piggy are Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Mm-hmm. And I think Lizzie and Darcy are both human beings. 
Although I would love to see Beaker somewhere, and I'm just not sure where. <laughs> like he could, he could go almost anywhere. But um, yeah, yeah, I think Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Wickham could What's... be. Uh, oh, Pepe, Pepe the the shrimp guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think Sam Eagle would be a phenomenal Mr. Collins. Yes. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh. oh, oh no! Yes, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Did you, I'm sorry. Did you ever say Mr. Collins was Pepe? No, uh, Mr. Wickham was Pepe. Mr. Wickham. I think that um, Beaker could be a really funny Mr. Collins. Oh, that's true. <laughs> it that fits the, true. the the manic energy. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so if if Sam Eagle is not Mr. Collins, I think we can make Sam Eagle Mr. Darcy, actually, then, because he can just sort of stand in the corner of the party and say, you are all weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty delightful. Okay. Right. I'm glad we've got that settled. Back to history <laughs> as story. <laughs> oh, uh, this is What a segue. Yeah, this is... I couldn't figure out how to make that work before the intro, so this is just how it is. We're rolling with it. So history as story. This is something that's distinctive to Christianity, that it in fact has things to say about events not in some timeless mythological alternate plane, but here on Earth in the history in which we live. This is really our history, not just the mythological history. Well... Three things come to mind. One of them just just did, but the to go with the the classic Christian intro and explanation. Surely everybody has read "Till We Have Faces." Eh, most people haven't. Honestly, of all, I hadn't Lewis's until books, like last year. Yeah, of all Lewis's books, yeah. it's the most neglected. And, and there I are think reasons. I started it, is. it in high school. Finish. Okay. I didn't finish. I made it about a chapter in, and I was like, "There's other books I need to read." This is where you plead the fifth because you're talking to a, a former high school teacher. Of yours. No. no, it wasn't. It wasn't for an assignment. We didn't okay. have it as a as an assignment. It was personal. Didn't, claim, didn't <laughs> claim it on your reading list. So I will try not to give much away, but suffice to say that it is the story of it's a retelling of the psyche cupid story as if it really happened, except there really are gods. And uh, Psyche has an older sister. In the, the original myth, there were a couple, but she has, well, there's another one here, but we don't have much to do with it. The older sister is kind of, uh, well, she's ugly. She's homely. But that very thing forces her to assume more responsibilities. And eventually she rises to become queen and kind of bosses her little sister Psyche around and kind of controls her and all that until one day the god comes and wishes her away and she loses Psyche forever. And she's very upset with this and spends her life being sad for herself that the gods have taken her little darling sister whom she loves so much and it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. Well, one day while she is traveling from point A to point B and the, the little expedition is stopped in a forest, she goes out just to wonder and get away from everybody because nothing makes her happy. No one makes her happy. She doesn't want to talk to anybody. And she comes upon a little shrine in, um, in the middle of the forest. And there is a statue, an idol, that has a black hood over it. And she wonders about this. And then the, the local priest comes up and says, would you like to hear the story of the goddess Istra? Um, sure. Well, and But the priest begins, for a nickel or whatever, the priest begins to tell the story of Istra, and the queen, Aurel, recognizes it as the story of her little sister. So she wants to hear this. And so it gets to the point where the god has taken Istra away, and yet everything falls apart, and what's happened and the priest stops his story. And, and the queen wants to know, well, how does it end? Well, she goes about the earth mourning and mourning. I know people who are sad mourn, being one of them. <laughs> what happens? Well, in the spring, we take the hood off of the statue and Istra comes back to life and the world is reborn and nature revives. But then in the fall, we put the hood back on because nature dies 
and the land mourns uh, her descent. And um, yes, but 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 no. What I I get that. What happened to her? Well, in the spring, we take the hood <laughs> off of the statue. <laughs> And nature revives, but in the fall, nature dies, and so we put the hood back. And eventually, Horal, the queen, recognizes that the priest is incapable of differentiating between a real historical event and a religious story. To him, the one phases into the other, and there is no answer to what became of the girl Istra, because this is a religious story. And religious stories are open-ended, mythological, cyclical, there is no resolution year after year, same story, acted out in the rituals of a temple. The story is, in fact, about temple ritual and therefore is not a story because it doesn't have an ending. It can't because it's cyclical. It just keeps going over and over again. And Oral eventually gets that and walks away disgust, saying he doesn't get it and I'm not getting through. I'm not going to learn anything that I want to know that's meaningful because this man only thinks in terms of religion, which is to say, the stories, quote unquote, connected with the rituals of the temple. Lewis is showing us something about the pagan conception of religion. Religion is, to borrow the line from Dr. Schaefer, an upper story experience symbolized by things that we know, but not truly manifest or connected with in any way our ordinary lives. To put it in Christian terms, Christ rose for the dead rose from the dead for me as he did for the disciples when he came alive in their hearts. And he's alive in my heart. Is he alive in your heart? <laughs> if he's alive in your heart, then he lives for you. But was the body gone from the tomb on the third day? But that doesn't, that doesn't matter. That's a question for science. Religiously, he's alive and we can celebrate. He lives within my heart. That's... Gnosticism. Gnosticism. <laughs> ding. And it's neo-orthodoxy. Mm. Uh, Bartianism. It's not Christianity, but there are a great many Christians who are caught in the same kind of dialectical conflict. There's fact and, and things that can be measured and weighed and touched and recorded historically on the one hand, and then there's religion and meaning on the other. And these two do not touch except insofar as certain things in history we can point to. We can point to the empty tomb, which may or may not have been empty. And that becomes a symbol of resurrection life in us. We can point to the cross, and that becomes a symbol of atonement in that I now feel better about myself. But there's no actual penetration of the supernatural into history, merely a dim reflection in terms of symbols and such. And uh, that brings me to the second thing I wanted to refer to. This is, uh, I don't remember how I found this originally, but right now it's on, I think it's Gospel Coalition, but I can't see the title. Anyway, it's by John Updike. He wrote it as a very young man, and it's titled um, Seven Stanzas at Easter, and it goes mm -hmm. like this. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the soul of cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecule re -knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. It was not as the flowers each soft spring recurrent. It was not as his spirit in the mouths and fuddled eyes of the eleven apostles, it was as his flesh, ours. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that that pierced, died, withered, paused, and then regathered out of enduring might new strength to enclose. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping, transcendence making, of the event, a parable, a sign painted in the fading credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back. The stone that's rolled back is not paper mache, not a stone in a story, but the vast rock of materiality that in the slow grinding of time will eclipse each of us the wide light of day. And if we have an angel at the tomb, make it a real angel. Mm -hmm. Weighty with pack, with Max Planck's quanta, vivid with hair, opaque in that dawn light, robed in real linen, spun on a definite loom. Let us not seek to make it less monstrous for our own convenience, our own sense of beauty, lest awakened in one unthinkable hour, we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed 
by the remonstrants. There's an answer to neo-orthodoxy in flat terms. Mm -hmm. Let's not play games with God. God's describing history, and he means it. And we can't shove it aside and still have Christianity. We may have some post-Kantian uh, mystical experience, but it's not what the Bible is talking about. That actually reminds me of a, of a great song by Andrew Peterson mm -hmm. called His Heart Beats, where mm -hmm. it very uh, definitely walks through. And it's like his heart beats, his blood begins to flow, waking up what was dead a moment ago. He breathes in, his living lungs expand, mm -hmm. and the heavy air surrounding death turns to breath, t turns to breath again. It's like... Mm -hmm. It's real. It, it's, yeah. This isn't some emotional, spiritual enlightenment in type that we right. experience the anti-type of. It's yeah. real, a real historical event and action with a real body and real blood and air entering lungs. It's real. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it except to say it's <laughs> <Yeah>. real. <laughs> <laughs> there's a great scene in The Great Divorce, also by Lewis, where a young man is talking to a theology professor who's, who <laughs> went to hell and doesn't even know where he's been. But theology professor keeps insisting, I, I want the religious value, I want the religious truth. And you, you're trying to just tell me that it's just like God's just there? <laughs> yeah, well, that would be of absolutely no religious significance to me whatsoever, and as such, I would not be interested in it. I mean, what what is my mind to do if it's not free philosophical play to search after ultimate mysteries? If you could just, you know, wrap up and give me God's phone number or something or page him for me. Do you not even believe he exists? What is existence after all? Oh, dear. Yeah. You know. that, that scene is probably one of my favorites in the book, too, because it's just <laughs> – Lewis just has so much fun <laughs> mocking people like this. <laughs> Sort of, a, sort of a grim fun, but fun nevertheless. Yeah, <laughs> yes, there's, there's sure. lots of but, grim like, fun. But the inverse of that is so wonderful when you realize that the God that you serve, that has called you by name, is the same God who made the trees and the earth and the mm. sky and who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Like the same person. Yeah. Like that's pretty, pretty wonderful when that hits you. And that man who went to the cross is that mm -hmm. same God. Yes. Uh, it's it's the most incredible, wonderful story anyone could ever believe once they've believed it. Until mm. then, it sounds an awful lot like a fairy tale, and no intelligent, rational mind would ever accept that as reality. Maybe it's a religious <laughs> symbol pointing to something. The third thing I wanted to bring up, and I, I probably have mentioned this before, but it just comes to mind, and since we're talking about history, this is a good place. Uh, you may or may not remember a TV series called Xena Princess Warrior. <laughs> okay. During her many adventures, Xena encounters the Trojan warriors, fresh from Troy, Julius Caesar, going about his conquests, and Joseph and Mary leaving Bethlehem with a baby. She does, she does no time traveling. <laughs> She just randomly meets all kinds of people because, one, the, the producers probably figure no one's going to care. Or, two, no one knows that these people live at different times. You'd like to have to have a history degree or something, so it'll fit just <laughs> fine. And, three, don't they all belong to the world of myth and legend and ancient times? And you know where this is going with me. <laughs> Bible Bi times, Bible places, Bible people. Bible people, Bible stories. Uh, which the evangelical and fundamentalist church, even reformed churches, have often been guilty of. When we don't tell the Bible stories as a, as a continuous story in order with historical sequence, we don't attach it to a chronology, and we don't explain how one story leads into the next. So, you know, one week we get David and Goliath, the next we get Noah and the flood, the week after that, Jesus is stilling the tempest, and the week after that, Paul's being let down in a basket. And children hear these, like, these are, these are nice, cool stories, with no conception 
that there is a sequence here and a meaning. It's like watching clips from Star Wars randomly generated in order. <laughs> because, well, here's some cool fighting scenes. And here's some cool uh, spaceships fighting each other. And here's some more of those kooky robots running around. Yeah. Did you know there's this, that this is part of a movie and there's, there's actually a storyline here? No. I mean, with 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 uh, the Phantom Menace, that's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> Better the Phantom Menace than whatever came after it. Clone oh, Wars. Yeah. This Clone Wars. Uh, Attack of the Clones. Yeah. Yeah. Worse. Anyway. <laughs> Anywho. So yeah. as we talk about history, let's 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 keep those things in mind. First of all, the Bible is a historical book, and I think many people who've never read the Bible will find that a little surprising. They know that there are stories that Christians think are historic, but what they don't generally realize is the whole book is set in the context of history. Almost all the books are dated in terms of the reign of such and such a king, either a Jewish king or um, a Gentile king, from empires we know, uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, or they're tied to a chronology, uh, so many years from Adam, so many years from the flood, uh, so many years from Abraham's entrance into the land to the Exodus, so many years from the Exodus to the building of Solomon's temple, the 490 years, 77s from the decree of Cyrus to the coming of Christ, and all kinds of other chronological data along the way that says this is a real story that has a sequence. Not only, not only does A follow B, but we know generally by how many years or decades or centuries mm -hmm. A follows B. We, we can see, okay, enough time for these people to move here, enough time for this person to have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, enough time for this nation to come into existence and suddenly be a threat. We can, we can see a historical unfolding and the books self-consciously point this out, usually in the first few verses. Um, I've got the quote from Luke's gospel. Luke is a superb historian. Mm -hmm. And this comes in, um, the third chapter. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etruria, and of the region of uh, Trachonitis and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Ca Annas and Caiaphas being high priests, the word of the God came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. We know most of these people from secular history. We know the geographical districts over which they reign. We know facts about how they were administered. We we know where Judea is. And it's not just sometime during the reign of, of Tiberius. 15th year in. It's very exact. And the, the, the Bible is like this. We're telling true history. And but but what about all the other books? There are history books, but but then how about the Psalms. Well, the Psalms generally, for instance, are describing a particular event in the life of David or some other psalmist. And sometimes the titles tell us exactly what it is. But even if they don't, we can read the psalm and say, oh, this person was undergoing this kind of crisis, this kind of difficulty, or this kind of blessing. And this is coming out of us. Or the psalm itself is recording history in a poetic form, but it's still history. The fact that you put in poetry doesn't make it untrue. Uh, it just is a more beautiful, thoughtful way of, of talking about it. You get to Paul's epistles. Well, they're not history. Yeah, they're written to real historical churches with real historical problems. And we're, we're getting a snapshot. I mean, what do historians love as source documents? Communication between two people, yes. two different people. That's just great. Especially when it references times and places and culture and customs. And the whole Bible is like that. Now, you can pick up some of Hindu literature or some of American cult literature. And sometimes you can't even read through the syntax. <laughs> it's just, it's about the level of Lewis Carroll, who's really going to study the Utopia Garden Gibble of the Way. You know, what is this even talking about? Well, that's religious language. Well, see, there we go again. Religion takes us out of the phenomenal, out of that which we can discuss with words, that which has historical grounding, and takes us to some other plane, some other dimension. But that's not what the Bible does. The Bible always grounds us in a physical reality. About 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus of Nazareth, who was also the eternal son of God, went to a specific cross on a specific hill outside 
Jerusalem and died specific, pouring out specific drops of blood while people taunted him, and he gave his soul a sacrifice for sin. And three days later, he physically, biologically, medically, physiologically rose from the dead so that he was no longer dead, but he was actively alive, as we've said, with pumping heart and nerves firing and synapses firing and all of that, so that when he walked out of the tomb, he left imprints in the sand. He was really there. You, If you reached out and touched him, you would have felt warm flesh. He's that alive. The story is that real. And we're and, and something you said earlier, Emily, we're part of that story. And that's the thing. If we're going to teach history to our kids, that's the thing. The story's not over yet. Mm-hmm. There's a line in Lord of the Rings when Sam and Frodo are taking a rest. I think, I, I don't remember what Sam's like in the Sarge or something. And he says, Oh, that reminds me of this story about you know, prying the Silmaril out of the crown of Morgoth. And so, oh, but, but wait, the light from that is the light in the file you're carrying. We're part of the same story. Mm-hmm. Don't these stories ever end? No. no. Tolkien knew that when he wrote Lord of the Rings, that he was simply building on the Silmarillion, which he hadn't even written yet. <laughs> uh, and we look back at the Bible and say, that's our story. We're part of this. Uh, and one day we'll all get together and we'll all tell our parts to one another and probably be surprised at a good many things. Wait, you mean you're the daughter of? Wait, you knew so-and-so. Wait, you picked up that book from? Wait, you were the one who did that just before I went in, which made it possible for me to go in so that... <laughs> God has an incredibly complex story. And I'm sure he's smiling. Wait till they, wait till they find out what a coincidence it is. Both on them. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> There's so much we don't know, but it's not accident. It's plot. Plot <laughs> is deliberate. Plot is intentional. Plot moves forward on some level. It may not, the action often may seem to be retarded, that is to go backward. But in the process, the characters in their character move forward. We grow. We learn to trust God more. And so there's always some kind of forward motion in God's story. God never rewinds and gives us a second chance in that sense. The second chance comes as a new chance, Mm -hmm. not the old chance rewound. And everything is always new as we flow toward the future and the future flows toward us. Mm -hmm. We do have to be careful, I think, in especially in American history, sometimes there's a temptation to say, ah, yes, God has a story and I understand exactly how it's flowing. And (laughs) isn't God clever? Look at his providential founding of the United States. And these documents definitely inspired, right? (laughs) Let's not do that. (laughs) Yeah, I used to work for a gentleman who was um, a leader in the America's Christian history movement. Mm -hmm. He He was a good man. He really truly was a gentleman. But I, I had to. Ha- I was forced by my connection with him to hang around with some of the people who who took on that kind of attitude, and it was at times embarrassing. Yes, there were interesting things that God did that stood out that that helped the colonists, and and part of the problem here is people say, "See, that's providence." Yes, and when the Americans lost battles, that was providence. Also providence. Yeah. And when George Washington's doctors bled him to death because it was the thing to do. That was also providence. I, I asked this, this man had two uh, sons that passed through my class. And I asked each of them in turn, in light of their father's ministry and his emphasis on providence, what is providence? First of all, they could not answer that, which was interesting, hmm. given that this is something that their father pounded on a lot. But when I, I kind of gave them a hint and said, well, do, you, do you think it's like, and I, did, well, I wasn't giving them the right answer, I was feeding them a false answer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like when God comes in and does really nifty things in history. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Providence is God's total control of all things. The everywhere present power of God, whereby his, whereby his hand, he upholds heaven and earth with all creatures. And so governs them that all things happen, not, all things happen not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Obviously, um, that just means most things. Yeah, most <laughs> some important things. <laughs> The big yeah, things. I, I was talking to a young college student a couple of days ago, and he had this very question. He was a young man. He hadn't had all the advantages that we had, I think, as, as growing up in Christian schools. But he was struggling. He was trying to figure it out. And he, he, he put this question to me quite seriously, he was, and he listened for a real answer. He said, but yeah, we, we, you just, God can control everything, 
God is in nature sovereign and he could rule everything, but does he choose to do so? so okay, you got to think about that. <laughs> what, what is the alternative? Yeah, well, how many things does it take for God not to control before he loses control completely? Mm -hmm. How about if there's this little bacteria he doesn't control? What if there's this asteroid headed toward Earth that he doesn't control? What if he doesn't control that one moment, one moment when this man and woman get together and conceive a child or fail to conceive a child because they have a little tizzy fit at each other and history's altered forever? To, for God to be the storyteller, for God to be sovereign and in control, for God to predestinate, he must also actively bring to pass Everything he's planned. Isn't that fatalism? No, because God used second, secondary causes. He creates us to be the sort of people we are, and we choose to be the sort of people we are, so that when the time comes and he needs X to happen to the story, wow, look at this. We're the people who absolutely would choose X and would not have it any other way. How does God do all that? I don't know. I don't know how God created heaven and earth out of nothing either. <laughs> and that's usually where I come back to. I think I, I think that's what I said to this young college student. It's, you explain to me how God made heaven and earth out of nothing. And then I will solve for you the mystery of man's free will and responsibility versus God's predestination. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. There's a reason Genesis, yeah, there's a reason Genesis 1 1 is Genesis 1 1. And it's the first mm -hmm. verse in the Bible. Once you accept that God does things for real and that we can see the consequence of, and we have absolutely no conception how in the world you would do that, then so much just becomes easy from there on out. It's, it's just, do we know? No. But we can believe what the Bible says, that man's choices are meaningful, that man is responsible, that God holds him accountable, and there's nothing unfair about it, because man is choosing to be what he wants to be. He's acting out of his own heart. And yet God has a plan from eternity, and he actively brings it to pass. And there's no contradiction there. I don't get that. Exactly. You're not God. So, <laughs> will we understand it all one day? No, because you're still not God. <laughs> Father along will know all about it. Father along will understand why. I don't think so. <laughs> not I, I, necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. There's no, well, someday God will explain it all. No, he'll probably explain a lot because he likes to tell his story and think about it. But there's going to be some things that he can't explain because we're finite and he's infinite. Mm -hmm. And we have to be okay with that. We have to accept God is a storyteller who has multiple goals for us, but the chief one around which everything spins is he is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, and thus he causes all things, all things, to work together. There's that storytelling thing. We're bringing lots of different things together into one storyline for our good, that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus. Us is predestination. And so again, as we look at Christianity, we're looking at a religion that's grounded in history, that in which God himself reveals himself in history, through history, real historical events in which he not only governs our history, but himself in the person of his son comes into our history uh, and thus becomes a historical character forever. The incarnation did not end when Jesus ascended. God stands outside of time. Jesus, according to his human nature, is within time and always will be from here on out. He will always be our flesh. He will always be true man. And so now he gets to enjoy the ride of the story too, which is got to be a kick up its own kind of thing. <laughs> but so as, as we talk about Christianity. Author inserts have been happening for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never thought of it in those terms, but that is so, so accurate. Yeah. You know, what if Shakespeare made himself show up in Hamlet? You know, well, <laughs> Tom God, Bombadil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just fun sometimes. That's it's why just, it's just fun. It's a little more than fun in God's case, but it was oh, at yeah. least fun for him. At God times, like it. it wasn't all fun for sure. <laughs> yeah, there's the, the the whole cross thing, but ultimately, even that was his joy. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Uh, joy carried him through it, even though mm -hmm. physically it hurt literally like hell, because that's what he endured in the cross when God made his soul an offering for sin. And yet the greater joy of what it was accomplishing carried him through all that, uh, his love for us, his desire to see his seed, uh, both, in, both by omniscience, as he 
as he hung on the cross, and one day in person when we are all together at the climax of the story that passes into the next great story, as Lewis would say. And so when we start teaching Christianity, we find ourselves teaching history. The early, mm -hmm. the first creed, the first major creed of the church is the Apostles' Creed, which is all about history. God created history. Jesus came down into history, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, particular civil ruler of a particular Roman administration district at a particular time in earth's history, crucified, dead, buried, rose again physically, literally from the dead. The church operates in history, and the issue then is not Gnostic realization, but the forgiveness of sins, because we've broken the law of a God who has revealed himself. And the church, which operates in history, and then finally the resurrection of the body into everlasting history. Sometimes we talk about, well, history ends, redemptive history ends. There's a day when the church is saved. But the time flow continues. A lot of people seem to get the idea that we will live outside of time. I think it's because uh, there's that old hymn, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. <laughs> That's a misunderstanding of a phrase in Revelation where the idea of he swears by, forever and, by him who lives forever and ever, the time will be no more. I mean, time's up is what Revelation is saying. There'll be a time when the cry of the martyrs, God will answer, time will be up, no more delay, some translation. Pencils under. down, please. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, blow the whistle, call the game. But life goes on afterwards, and eternal life goes on, well, eternally. And so the story in that sense never, never ends. Uh, we will always be telling the old, old story throughout mm -hmm. endless ages. And there's something to think about when we start yeah. pondering eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will be a real eternity. It will not be an upper story experience that we label eternity because we're lame and can't come up with anything. <laughs> we will have real bodies, real fingers and toes and feet. And however, our eternal organs will be arranged at that point so that they're immortal. We'll see with our eyes and hear with our ears and sing with our voices. Mm -hmm. And it will be a real renewed creation. Our feet will touch earth. Our feet will touch <laughs> earth. We will breathe air. It will be a real planet in a real solar system or something like that. We're not told all the details of how God will arrange it. But there will be stuff to do. And I, my suspicion is that a lot of young men, especially the virile, manly, I need to go out and throw something type, are turned off from Christianity because what they see of heaven is sitting around in an eternal worship service, listening to a preacher, singing songs they don't like. And that's, you know, who an infinite that? white field with a, with a hazy yes. filter over it. Yeah. 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 You've seen that too. Yeah. Uh huh. That kind of thing. And you're wearing a dress. And you're wearing <laughs> this is a dress. Um, yeah. Uh, rather than seeing it as a real world where you can't die anymore. So does that mean, this is what my suit says. So does that mean if I got in like a Lamborghini and ran it straight into, as fast as I could, into a stone wall, I'd survive and it wouldn't even hurt. Yeah, pretty much. I so want to do that. Good. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, I can climb half Pegasus dome and jump something. off for the heck of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be so fun. Yeah. I mean, so like, I'm not into skydiving. Like, I don't want to jump out of a moving plane, especially <laughs> a perfectly good moving plane. Um, but I love heights. Like, I'm, yeah, jumping off of something high sounds cool. Um, let's talk a little bit more about history as part of a corporate and individual identity. Because like, we see that even with American history, where even those of us who have come into our American identity, not by way of the pilgrims, somehow <laughs> our story still starts with the pilgrims or before. Like there's this specific train that is really important to our understanding what it means to be an American, even though like my family came over in the 20th century, you know, it's not yeah. my we story in the sense that I'm descended from them. Somehow it still is my story. Yeah, it's your story in that you entered into a covenantal corporate existence that goes back far beyond your lifetime and that of your parents and grandparents and great grandparents. America had its own story going and you've joined the cast. It's <laughs> always great when someone leaves and someone new comes on the cast and you say, huh, I don't know if I like this person or not. I wonder how they're going to, what kind of chemistry they're going to generate here. You start questioning the writers and the, the uh, oh, casting director's choice. Of, of, but this happens all the time in real life. Um, it happens with nations. It happens with families. 
I didn't even know this guy. Now I'm marrying him and we're going to have a story together. But my story goes way back before I even met him. And how does that? Because God does that. He blends multitudes of storylines and plot lines together to create a greater story. When you come to America, America does have a story. And God has been active in our story. And it, that story includes some very decided Christian roots planted by very strong Christian people with very good theology. And then some strong Christians who had not so great Christian theology <laughs> and some very weak Christians who had no theology to speak of whatsoever and some flat out heretics. And then there are the apostates who said they were Christian or tried to imply that, but actually never were. And all of this is feeding into our institutions, our culture, the way we speak, our cultural illusions, assumptions we make. America does have, Americans have a vision, at least until this generation. And, and even in spite of everything that's happened, we have a vision of what America's for. We talk about liberty, freedom. We talk about our responsibility to others, to the nations. We talk about America as a sanctuary and a, light, a city on a hill, a light to the world. We fought wars to make the world safe for democracy. So we said, <laughs> and you know, we can look, we can look behind the curtain and see what was really going on. But if they had not used those phrases and those images, they couldn't have sold World War One and World War Two nearly so easily, or the Spanish-American War, or the Westward Expansion. They had to borrow Christian concepts and Christian words because that resonated with people. That's part of us. That and same those kind words of, were incredibly powerful. Yeah. And that same thing, though, wouldn't have worked in, say, Italy right. or Egypt. It just, you know, no. Now, Scotland, Scotland <laughs> had a very decided, it still does, view of its own of its own heritage, starting with giving England a black eye and a bloody nose. But <laughs> but then England also has this vision that it's a special people. And but theirs manifested itself as empire. Uh, and the white man's burden and all that. But other countries are safe, just are, are good to just we are the final order. Think of Russia. We were before the Marxists take over. We are the final order. We are the final expression of the kingdom of God on earth. We're it. Come join us and submit to our glory. They they were the third Rome, Rome, Constantinople, Moscow. They saw themselves as a continuation of that story. Hmm. And it shaped and their And Rome is a continuation of Troy. <laughs> yes, and Rome is a continuation of Troy. Yeah. So identity. Uh, there's an an episode of Babylon 5, which I would recommend to you if you if you know anything about the series. Our heroes are being tested by the powers that be to see if they're worthy to carry on the great responsibility. And so an inquisitor appears who takes them to a dark place in the bowels of the ship and simply begins asking them the question, who are you? And at first our heroes don't know what to make of that. And they give their name. No, that's your name. Who are you? Well, I'm the son of this, I'm the daughter of this. That's relationships. Who are you? Now in that universe, in that storyteller, He's trying to get at something internal in the heart. And yet the, the answers were not bad answers. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible's covenantal. Who am I? I am the husband of Kate Ettinger. I am the father of Emily Haley and Mary Ellen Ettinger. I am the friend of, start listing all of my friends. I work with you people. I work for this school and these people who, who treat there. I was the student of. I am a member of the congregation and this place that meets at this time, and these are the elders, these are my pastors. That's true meaning. That's true identity. Because I'm unique. The other people who have done some of these things and are some of these things, but that's my story. And it is defined in terms of relationship. I am, a, I am an American. And I'm not ashamed of that. And so as we, we, we talk about entity, who are you? I've, I've asked the same question of my kids at school. And do regularly year by year and they too generally are, are flustered what, what i don't know what that means can't wait till i ask you the next couple of questions in the series <laughs> where are you going what do you want whom do you serve and whom do you trust these our relationships and the historical flow mean something and if i lose the historical order okay well i remember this is not me but some hypothetical character says well uh, I remember, I, I, I'm recovering from amnesia, but I remember something about a war and I was wearing a uniform and firing a gun. So I must have been a soldier in a war. What war? I don't know. Where? I don't remember. What was your rank? I don't know. But then I also remember 
being married. What well, were you married before or after the war? I don't know. Did you have children? Yeah, I remember holding little baby arms, boy or girl. I don't know. Well, did you hold the baby before or after you got married? <laughs> I don't know. When we start losing historical sequencing, when we lose our story, we lose our identity. We are characters mm -hmm. in a story. Some of the elements are big and easy to talk about. Some are little finesse things that we rarely share with anybody. But God knows. Mm -hmm. And that's the story he wrote for us. And as we find our story rooted in his bigger story, I'm a Christian. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm an agent of his kingdom. One of my, my wife had once asked the girls to say, ask your dad why he teaches. And my answer was simple. It's always been the same one, although hardly anyone ever asks. Why, why do you teach? Why do you do this? I'm fighting for the life of the world. Now, that may seem grandiose and um, full of hubris, but it doesn't mean that I'm the only one doing it or that mm -hmm. I am a big player in this. But that's simply the battle. Go make disciples of all nations. See all nations blessed. God so loved the world. You should too. So that's what I'm doing according to the gifts that God gives me. What we're doing here is part of that little part. I don't know what God's going to do with it. He could do great things. He may do seemingly nothing. Although at least some of the people who watch or listen, sorry, this is not TV, <laughs> tell us it is a blessing and they've grown. So that's good. But uh, people out there who are listening, please invite other people to listen. I'd like a thousand listeners, not so I can vote, hey, we have a thousand people listening. But because I think touching a thousand lives with the truths of the gospel is a worthy goal. And if God only gives us a couple hundred, great. If he gives us 10,000, great. God be praised. But I think as when you're in a story, you, you see where the story's going and you've got a goal. In a mystery story, you want to solve the mystery. In a war story, you want to win the battle. In a romance, you want to win the girl's heart and marry her. My the goal of my story is to see the world embrace the truth of the gospel. And I will not live to see it all. But the more we can pass this vision to others, the more it will come, the more the kingdom will come day by day, however small or large our parts may be. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a good note to finish on. Do you have any recommendations for us this evening? I have one, I think. I may have made it before, but I don't know. The author is William Kirk Kilpatrick. He's a Roman Catholic, although he never mentions it, but it becomes obvious if you read the book. The book is Psychological Seduction, The Failure of Modern Psychology. And there are a couple chapters, it looks like it's eight and nine, that talk some of what we've been talking about. Uh, life is story and the idea that sanity, mental saneness, rests in finding your place in the story. If you're disconnected, if you're rootless, if you have no relation to other people and other things, then of course your life is meaningless. You're thrown back on existentialism where you, by your own choices, are creating yourself day by day. That may sound all heroic and all, but it's really dumb and it's self-destructive. So once we understand and so once we understand, understand ourselves as characters in God's story, then meaning returns and man needs Meaning, when I was in college, I read a book. I was in a class on an, an existentialism. And I read a book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And it recounts, uh, I believe, his own experiences in a German prison camp. And it, it's, life was so meaningless. And he found that the people who survived the prison camps were those who had a sense of meaning. Have, have you read the book, Brian? I read it late last year. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, meaning makes all the difference. It, it gives you sanity, it grounds you in reality, and it gives you hope to go on. If there's no meaning, then why not just kill yourself, really? And we live in an age when a lot of young people have lost meaning and they've lost hope and suicide rates are horribly up. And losing community, particularly during quarantine and all that's followed, has not helped any because we need community. We need relationship. Uh, that's part of the meaning. I cannot by myself create meaning for myself. Ultimately, I need God, but God has people. Anyway, the, the whole book is really worth reading. There's one kind of flaky chapter that you can skip over. And you'll figure out what that is easily enough. But the other <laughs> stuff, the other stuff is, is, is good. It's well written. The kids I've assigned it to have generally enjoyed it. It's not, it's not an uphill trudge. So um, psychological seduction. It's not about seducing people. It's about how psychology seduces us away from the truth that's in Christ or can. 
under mm-hmm. the wrong circumstances. The author himself is a psychology, so you know, <laughs> he sees benefits. Wait, maybe I mi- misheard which book you were talking about. Is that the name of the book? That's Psychological the book I seduction. recommended, but I could recommend yeah. Man's Search for Meaning, too, since I mentioned oh, that Oh, thank one. you. Like, yes. Yeah. Which is also- <laughs> I was phenomenal. talking about Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. And that's, I, I had gone there, and you, you echoed it. Anyway. Faye. And Emily, how about you? <laughs> I actually want to recommend a beverage. David made us some delicious hamburgers earlier this week, and we enjoyed them while sipping this sort of coffee beer that Guinness has put out. It's a cold brew, nitro-infused whatnot. (laughs) I don't have it anymore because we drank it, so I can't like read the can to you. But if you go into a store that purveys such goods, I'm sure you can find it. Very it's kind well. of anticlimactic after a wonderful well, now episode I, about the scope now I have of history. One. Now <laughs> okay. I have one, which will help. Again, we can edit this part out of me saying that I have one, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can make it less uh, anticlimactic. I'm going to recommend um, Acts of Service because mm. they're a wonderful way to let people know that you care about them, especially if the act of service you are performing is one that they don't like doing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Such as cooking when my husband does it. Where's my heart? <laughs> or um one one thing that my my fiance hates doing it is uh washing dishes. So when I go over mm. while she's at work, I let out my dog, I take him for a walk and then I I pretty frequently just wash her dishes for her as well. And it's, I love doing it because I know how much it stresses her out. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yay. All right. Thank you, David, for editing this part, <laughs> making it smooth. Well, I think that is all we have for this evening. So thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a joy. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. If you'd like to send us an email, you can do so. Our email address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can check out our show notes and transcripts if you prefer to read the podcast rather than listen. You can do that. You can find those on our website, which is anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion. Tell a friend about us. See you next week.